ECMO solution, and those antennas will support transmission in both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. So the last access point we want to talk about is the 1550 series, and these are designed for deployment outside. It also comes in two models, one with internal antennas and another model with external antennas. Because it is an outside access point, it also comes with some different options for how you might want to connect it to the network, supporting things like Ethernet, fiber, cable as different backhaul mechanisms. You also notice that it has a more robust housing and that's because it's being deployed outside. So the clean air technology is what Cisco call spectrum aware, self-healing and self-optimizing. And what Cisco mean by that is that this access point will actually monitor the air quality. It literally has the Cisco spectrum expert capabilities included in it so it can detect the signal strength, interference sources, etc. And what it can do is it can provide that real-time analysis back to the network administrator, but it can also, if you set up policies, it can actually then enforce those policies. So for instance, it's integrated with the Cisco Radio Resource Manager, and so if it detects that there's significant interference for an extended period of time, it can actually switch that access point onto a different channel. Now, the client link technology is really all about mixed mode networks where you've got a combination of A, G, N devices. And what it's trying to do is make sure they're operating at the best possible data rate and where it kicks in is when it's on the edge of the cell. And what it does is it uses beam forming technologies similar to what was defined in 802.11n to improve the signal to noise ratio for your 802.11ag legacy equipment enabling those clients to get to better data rates or higher data rates. And the last one is video streaming technology. What this one does is it improves the customer's experience when they're doing video streaming. Let's say they're watching a YouTube clip. And how it does that is it introduces an admissions and control policy. So when a client wants to send video traffic, it has to get permission from the access point. And in this way, the access point can control the number of requests that it has for video type traffic and can make sure that the access point does not become oversubscribed such that you start to get a very poor video experience. Now the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to gathering information prior to a site survey visit is the possibility of putting a predictive plan together. A predictive plan literally takes the blueprints and site plans that you've been given plus the customer questionnaire plus details about the access points and antennas that you plan to deploy and creates a prediction of where the access point should go and what the coverage should look like. Now a predictive plan does not replace doing an actual physical survey, more as a supplement to doing that survey. And so when you go out and do the physical survey, you can take some actual measurements and you can feed that back into the predictive tool so that your actual site survey and your predicted model can actually start to align. There are several key advantages of doing this. One, it provides your customer with a model that helps explain the site survey. Secondly, it can provide a what-if analysis after you've done the site survey. For example, what if you change the antenna? What if you change the type of access point? And finally, it can give your customer a lot of assurance that the plan that you're proposing is robust and solid. 
So in this next part, we're going to talk about site survey equipment. So what equipment do you need to have to take out onto your customer site to conduct the actual survey? So when you start to think about preparing for the site visit, you're going to put your toolkit together. And sometimes you already have it pre-packed, but it's always worth checking, make sure nothing was taken out of your kit uh, following the last site survey that was done, or maybe there's some special requirements that this site survey is different from the others. Let me give you a couple of uh, for instances. When I'm going out to a warehouse location, I can't use the rig that I have that allows me to put the antenna up about 10 feet high, which is great in the office environment. If I'm going out to a warehouse, I need to think about other techniques to get that access point up to the height that I need it. And I also perhaps would take some larger Yagi antennas if I was doing a warehouse thinking about pushing that energy down those corridors between the racks that are storing all the equipment in the warehouse. So to help you put your site survey toolkit together, I want to share with you the checklist that I actually keep in my suitcase that I use before I hit the road. So let me take you through this checklist. The first thing on my list is the computer. Now, you may take a computer, a laptop, or you may take a PDA, and increasingly people are using tablets when they're out in the field. I'm a bit old school, so I always like to take my laptop. I always make sure that I have enough spare batteries to go at least eight hours, so I get a full working day. I take my power adapter as well, just in case I do get a chance to charge up my batteries. Next on my list is the site survey tool. And in this case, I'm looking at the Cisco Spectrum Expert. And the Cisco Spectrum Expert, I have to worry about the hardware plus the software. So I have to make sure I pack the card bus and the antenna that attaches to that card bus. And I also want to make sure that I've got the software that's installed on my laptop. So I've got all three and I don't turn up just with the hardware and not having the software to do the job. We come down, I've got antennas. Always want to take some antennas, and it does depend on your environment which antennas you take. In an indoor office environment, um, I've got an Omni antenna I would take with me, give me a little bit more gain, see what the coverage would look like than the Omni antennas that are sometimes integrated into the Cisco equipment. I take an antenna that fits into the corner of the office as well as a couple of wall antennas. As I mentioned earlier, if I was doing a warehouse, I'd take some Yagi antennas with me. And of course, if I was doing an outside deployment, such as a bridge or a mesh, you know, I might take some highly directional panel, uh, maybe even parabolic dish antennas. Always want to take antenna cables with you. And if you're doing an outside deployment and you're very knowledgeable with the regulatory issues, you may carry some antenna connectors as well. You have to be careful if you're connecting external antennas to make sure that you stay within your regulatory power transmission requirements. If we come down, next on my list is the access points. Now, it's clearly you want the physical access points, the hardware itself. I always take the specifications with me, maybe an electronic version, not necessarily a paper version. I also want to take the cable so I can connect to the console port. So that would be a serial cable plus the RJ45 to serial cable connector, or sometimes referred to as an adapter. I'd want to take several Ethernet cables, and if I was operating in a more difficult environment like some manufacturing environments or outside, I would also want to take some external housing to protect my equipment. If we come up, next on my list is power sources. So what I do is I put my access point on a mount, which then I can put close to the ceiling, but it may not be close to a power outlet, or I don't want to run cables from the access point 
to the power outlet just in case it causes a hazard and people start tripping over it. So what's really a good idea is that you take some battery packs with you so you can actually power the access point without needing to go into a power socket. Now depending on the access point that I'm taking out, depending on whether I have a power adapter for it, etc., I may actually power the access points using an Ethernet cable. So in which case I need to take the power injectors. Coming down, I've grouped this under what I call miscellaneous items. I obviously want an equipment case to put all of this equipment in and I normally have a hard case and I have a couple depending on how much equipment I need to take out onto the site. Digital camera is a must when you're going out on site because it's the easiest way to capture information. Rather than documenting everything, you can just take photos of it. So much easier to remember things like sources of interference, pillars and columns, obstacles that may impact your signal. I would advise you always to check with your customer first if they're comfortable you taking the camera on site. There are some areas like manufacturing floors that are very sensitive and will ban you from taking a camera onto the site, in which case you're going to have to revert to capturing that information manually. Clipboard and pens and pencils. Oh my goodness, I like to print out the customer survey questionnaire before I go and I literally write on it if I see something that contradicts it or that confirms the information that's on it. I also take out the blueprints and the site plan and I take paper copies of those and I write on them my observations where I saw interference. You know, there's like 20 microwave ovens in the cafeteria. I'll put that onto the plan. A measuring wheel or measuring tapes, these are great. You know, if you've got a site that you're not quite sure, you weren't given the blueprints, and you just want to measure the distance, you know, these are just simple surveyor tools that you can very quickly just confirm the length of a corridor, the size of a conference room, etc. Now, I do take binoculars if I'm working outside. Don't typically take them if it's an indoor deployment. The reason is, is if I'm deploying a bridge between two access points, I find it useful sometimes to actually look at the site that I'm trying to connect to. And when I'm doing a bridge, it normally takes two, so there's two of us, one at either end of the link, and therefore having a two-way radio, or these days just using the mobile cell phone, so that you can talk with the person that's setting up the other end of the link. That's an invaluable tool as well. It's also quite useful indoors as well if there's two of you doing a site survey and you're looking at spillover between floors. It can be quite good to be able to talk to each other and say, okay, I'm down tilting the antenna a little bit. What is the impact that you're starting to see now? I've got a list of paperwork here for you, just as a checklist before you go out of the door. On-site contact information. Who are you meant to be calling when you get there? What is their number? Do you have a backup contact? I always take the job or the work order with me. I may take the PO with me as well, but again, you just want to make sure that you've got that information just in case any customer questions come up. As I mentioned, I take the site survey questionnaire that they filled in, take the blueprints, any site plans, and any network diagrams that they gave me. The last category here, and I'm sure you'll want to add stuff to this as well. When you're doing a layer two site survey, one of the requirements is, is that you put your access point up in the location that you expect to deploy it. And you don't really want to be putting up mounting plates into ceilings, etc. So the easiest way to do this is to either create some sort of rigging like a tripod that you can hoist it up to the required height or else you strap it to the ceiling or to the wall where you want to place it. And some of the best ways of temporarily putting up your access point is by taking out some 
nice big clamps and even more perfect is the good old duct tape. Bear in mind